Community-supported agriculture, what, what are they basically? Um, basically, in their simplest terms, they're a, a risk, they're a, an agricultural model of distribution where the risk is shared between the consumer um, and the farmer. And um, your model in Brisbane, it's a little bit different, isn't it? It's not it just is. one farmer. Yeah, we've, we've basically uh, combined the best, we've hybridised the best of the traditional community-supported agriculture model, um, a, uh, a, a cooperative model in, in, in some of its structure, and uh, box schemes, or they call them subscription schemes in um, parts of England and America. Right. Yeah, so we've basically pulled the best parts of those together in a collaborate, you know, in um, collaboratively with a bunch of farmers from around Brisbane. Right, and when you're talking numbers, what are we looking at in terms of um, how many farmers and how many um, subscribers in Brisbane? We've uh, there's um, 75 farmers, right. um, uh, but there's probably about 100 farmers that we deal with on on, a, on around the whole year. Uh, with there's around about 40 staff. There's about 70 or so drop-off spots. We call them city cousins all around Brisbane. Um, and, uh, and around about 2,000 subscribers at this point. Right. What's the attraction, you think, for the consumer, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of, um, you know, the normal person who say, is it, goes to a supermarket and buys something off the shelf and, and a community-supported agriculture? What's the attraction? Um, the number one attraction is that they know where the food is coming from. So that's our, our ultimate aim is to provide that relationship between, or that connection between the farmer and, and the consumer. So um, that's, a, that's a big attraction. Um, and there's lots of other attractions as well. Obviously, food that comes from closer in is going to be fresher, and therefore it's going to be healthier for you. Yeah. Um, also, the fact that we're uh, this combination of a, of a hybrid um, community-supported agriculture venture and we're a non-profit means that we are, um, we're affordable. And for farmers' point of view, it means that we pay them a lot better. Yep. Um, and, uh, um, and, and buying food off us is, is also about... Uh, it's, it's a surprise every week. A lot of people talk about this, the convenience... The, the two things are the convenience, that it's been dropped off somewhere in their neighbourhood, um, pretty close, and they can pick it up at any time of that night, of, of the designated pick-up time. And the other one is that it's... Uh, um, as well as being convenient, it's also at a, an affordable price. Right. Mm. Uh, on, on a broader scale, we hear a lot about things like organic, biodynamics, things like that, but you mm. mentioned a uh, participatory, <coughs> participatory guarantee system. Let's explain that a little bit. So a PGS, a participatory guarantee system, is a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, like a, a standard that is developed between farmers and city folk that says we're happy with this this standard of food for our area. And so it's more for localised food distribution schemes, whereas the, the typical organic standards um, for biodynamics are for long distance markets where there's no relationship. So they have to have a third party come in, which is, which is usually costly and has a lot of bureaucracy attached to it, that says, we're going to put this stamp of approval on this, on this farm. Whereas in a PGS, it's more the, the subscribers and the farmers get together, develop up the standards and develop up a way of checking in um, and guaranteeing that those standards are kept. Right. And so each region can develop their own. That's right. There's no sort of one model. There's no one all. model. No, no. It's, yeah. it's, it's for each region to pick up uh, on, you know, there's so many PGS schemes around the world and they just go, that one looks like that's the one for us and we'll adapt it to suit our standards. Yeah. On an issue of scale, you know, you're mm. operating in, um, um, outside a, a city, uh, Brisbane, of, you know, two, three million people. Where, like, whereas regions here, like in the Bigger Valley, there's 35,000 in the whole whole Bigger Valley, you know, it wouldn't even come to a, a suburb of Brisbane. You know, uh, how do you see this kind of thing developing on such a small rural scale like, like mm. we've got here? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, in, a, in a small regional scale, there's, there's the obvious benefits that you're going to have a lot more farmers that you can um, approach and talk to. And obviously, uh, there's going to be a closer connection between farmers and city folk anyway. So, um, so you sort of haven't got those barriers that we would have in the city. From the scale point of view, from the population point of view, you could look at, well, who's already supplying the food to these, this 35,000 people already? And uh, what are they made up of? And generally, you'll find that supermarkets dominate. Now, um, I, I always take this approach that uh, if supermarkets own 60 to 80% of the market, then that's, 
that's the opportunity we've got mm. because really um, it's not it's a bit it's very costly it's also very poor food and where's the money going where's the profit going mm. and uh, you know when you ask those sorts of questions about the benefits of having a supermarket in your town um, you, I, I quite easily say well that's that's a big opportunity mm. for a box scheme or for a community supported agriculture yeah. scheme like ours. Yeah. Mm. Tonight you mentioned a uh, an interesting uh, issue to do with social justice and linking food, mm. affordable food, to social justice. <clears throat> interesting yeah. concept. Yeah. Well, um, there's two ways. Well, obviously, one is from the producer end of things. Um, we've been um, in the first world. We've sort of replaced a lot of subsistence agriculture around the world. Um, and, uh, and got them to cash crop, so grow coffee or grow bananas or grow something or other. And uh, we owe them an obligation um, to actually still keep trading with them, particularly around the non-perishables, the coffees, the teas, the chocolates, the coconut oils and those sorts of things. Um, well, they grow the best stuff anyway, so that shouldn't be a reason. But we shouldn't go to um, you know, some ex-merchant banker, white fella, who goes and buys a you know a nice squish dairy, puts in a coffee plantation, and then all of a sudden you know we we start buying off him. We we have an obligation from a social justice perspective to buy off and trade with those um, those uh, those first world uh, neighbours. Um, the other issue on the social justice side of things is um, farm labourers have been pretty much exploited in in, in Australian history. We want to we want to work with farmers who actually treat their employees like like humans. Now, there's two sides to that, is that farmers don't keep paid a lot, a lot of money anyway, so uh, they're always struggling to pay their own labourers a really, a, a, you know, a living wage, a good wage. So it's up to us in, in the distribution side of things to say, well, we're, gonna, um, we're going to look after these farmers so they can look after their, their people. Um, and then we start to look at or help them with those social social justice perspectives. Mm. Mm. Um, a lot of experts are tipping, you know, the picking of global oil. Mm. In terms of um, you know the CSA model and mm. the supermarket model, how do you think you'll go in terms of you're going to be way <laughs> ahead? Do you think? <laughs> I will. I will be way ahead. There's yeah. no doubt about that. Um, uh, obviously, you know, uh, supporting local farmers and uh, and working with them. So when the price of oil does go up. Uh, um, because we're going to be sourcing locally, then obviously that cost, or well, that percentage of our cost is going to be quite um, small compared to what a supermarket's going to have to bear. Mm. And basically supermarket success is very much on the back of cheap oil. It's mm. completely on the back of cheap oil. They're logistics mm. and amazing logistics systems uh, where they transport food all around the country and store it everywhere and all sorts of places is completely off the back of cheap oil. So... Mm. Um, CSA schemes are going to be right in right in the in the box seat um, as as the alternative um, uh, distribution system when those sorts of impacts start to um, rear their heads. Mm. Thanks, Robert. No worries at all. Cheers, John. Thank you.